Okay. Hope you had a good lunch, or at least, you know, you're not starving anymore. Um, my name is uh, John Alban Wilkins, and uh, yeah, I'm known as John Alban just about everywhere. Um, I'm a senior front-end developer. Uh, I work for Previous Next now. Um, that's a Drupal consulting company in Australia. Um, and I, I live in Taiwan, and uh, this is a picture of me in Taiwan um, with lemurs. They're at a zoo, but, you know, <laughs> they're not native there. Um, but uh, one of the things that I, that I like to do is, of course, to, like, make free software, right? That's why we're here at Drupal. Um, but I've also done Zen Grids. This is a SaaS system to allow you to easily build uh, responsive layouts. Um, then there's normalized CSS for SaaS and Compass. Um, there's a succinct theme for Colloquy. It's an, an IRC client for Mac. Um, Git SVN migrate does if, if you have some legacy subversion repositories, want to convert them to Git. Um, I had like a thousand subversion repositories lying around. Um, and of course, I've done the Zen theme and a bunch of Drupal modules. So that's me. Hello. <laughs> um, but I'm here today to talk about you know design components, but you know front end development. Right? Been kind of crazy the last few years. Uh, <laughs> it's it feels like there's a new thing every other week. Um, you know there's there's Gulp, uh, JS, there's Task Runners. Um, we're starting to do a lot of DevOps in the front end in order to automate our systems. Responsive design, of course, still relatively new. All these things. It. It's kind of crazy, and it, it, it's hard to like try to see where we're headed when we're just trying to figure out what the heck's going on right now, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I usually like to start uh, a lot of my sessions with this quote. Um, are you new to front-end development, right? Uh, here's a secret. No one else really knows what they're doing either. Uh, the good news is actually that, it, that it's gotten, gotten better. I feel like I'm starting to figure out what I'm actually doing. Um, you know, that's why I'm up here. I'm going to sort of give you a little bit of knowledge from what I've learned from being in the trenches. Um, and, and because I, I've been able to feel like I've gotten a little bit of a handle of what's going on, um, I've started looking forward to make sure that we're not, you know, going about like, hey, look at this cool new thing. It's called table-based layout. Right, <laughs> I don't want us to go down like the wrong path, um, and uh, I started started looking ahead, and the thing that I see is basically web components. Um, how many people here haven't heard of web components? So basically, almost everybody has have heard about it. Um, there's a couple of, of really good uh, the CSS tricks one is a great article that describes what web components are. Um, then of course there's the actual spec. It's it's a very new spec. It's still being built. Um, if you want to play around with it, there's basically JavaScript polyfills in order to do it because I don't think there's no there's no stable browser that actually has this implemented yet. Um, but basically, what web components are um, is it, the the HTML spec authors got together and they're like, hey, you know what? Web developers they really like these templating systems. Um, we should implement something like that in HTML. So what web components are basically is um, they've, they've taken this idea of like you know PHP and Twig, uh, all of these things that are that are templating systems, uh, mustache, all of these things, and said, okay, how do we implement that at the HTML level, right? Um, and for example, you can do things like you can create your own tag that is called carousel, right? Um, and it would include it would sort of encapsulate all of the design and you know so sort of the markup within that one tag. So you just use it one tag, and then all of a sudden it presents all of the the designs and configuration within it. Carousel, ugh. and more likely it's going to be like, oh god, oh god, why did my client listen to me about carousel's tag, right? <laughs> but <laughs> you can do something with with, with web components, right? Um, what, so what, what can we learn from this, right? Um, we we have reusable and repeatable components and self-contained design, right? So within a single web component, the CSS that's specified there doesn't bleed outside it. It's just encapsulated right there. Um, and I, I feel like that's 
that's like the major thing that we can we can actually do that now, um, but without the web component technology part. And it'll make sure that we're moving in the direction of the new technology that's coming. Right. So, have we done things? Have, how are we doing things? How have we done stuff in the past? And I include myself in this that haven't worked out for us, right, on CSS. Uh, I think sort of our biggest sort of sin um, is CSS specificity wars, right? <laughs> this is the only cat gift in the entire presentation, so <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> um, if, if you like cat gifts, I'm pretty sure Dave Reed is speaking sometime in this conference. Um, yeah. So, what do I mean specifically, right? So you, you write a selector, because these are the classes that Drupal gives you. Oh, I thought I changed these. Oh, well, whatever. Um, and uh, so you're you've styling this, this particular link inside your menu. You're like, okay, that looks great. This is our, my main navigation. Perfect. And then you realize, oh, over in the sidebar, I need a slightly different styling, uh, because it's a different design. Um, okay, I'll just... I'll just write sidebar menu item a link, right? So it gets more and more specific, and I'm having to undo styles from the previous rule um, in my sidebar. And then, you know, ugh, page 37. <laughs> some, <laughs> some manager decided it has to be different on that page. <laughs> uh, so you just you keep writing more and more specific, and you're having to override stuff, and it just gets really messy. Um, and, and there are a couple of things wrong with here. One is the specificity is just way too high, and it gets out of control. And the the and it's because the order that our rule sets are in in the actual style sheet matter, um, and that's just bad. Um, oh yeah, and you can rewrite this in SAS like this, and you're like, oh, this is better, less typing. Well, the problem is that all we've done is now we're auto generating the same awful CSS that we were writing by hand before. Um, so SAS doesn't fix this by itself. It's a great tool. Um, but this is not the way to fix this problem. So, uh, you know, part of those overly, you know, specific rule sets and selectors are also overly generic class names, and Drupal has these. And I'm sorry to say that I think maybe this one came from the Zen theme title. <laughs> Uh, it's everywhere, you know, block title, node title, views title. So if you want to apply a title styling, what, what does that mean? It doesn't, <laughs> you have to specify like the context in which it means something. And this is just, this is crazy. And then we have the same thing in, for content. <laughs> Not content, no, this, I apologize for the the, uh, the title one. That's pretty much mine. But the, the content one, I don't know who did that. <laughs> um, sometimes you just have to, accept your mistakes and move on. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about design components and how to fix those problems that we're having with our CSS. Um, and uh, what am I talking about? Well, a component is the same as, there's like 80 different articles that describe this stuff, you know. But it's basically the same thing as object in OOCSS by uh, Nicole Sullivan, uh, module in uh, Jonathan Snook's uh, Smacks, uh, block in block element modifier, UI patterns. These are, these are all the same thing. That's what a component is. Um, and, and the goals of our design components are to reduce the specificity, right? So instead of having like three different parts of our selector, we want to have a single class selector. Right. We're also trying to reduce the applicability, which means that we're trying to remove that context, the, the required context in order to get the, to the design we want. We don't want to have to specify context at all, like, oh, sidebar, right? Don't do that. Just the single component class. And then an improved maintainability. Because we are making it easier to apply design and, and have it be repeatable, that improves maintainability a lot. So design, design component... One class, one consistent style. I don't care where on the page, 
I am using you know, the button class. If I apply that class to a particular HTML element, I want it to have that style exactly. Okay. Um, and then we also have other kinds of, like here's some more examples, like navbar tabs, more link. This is sort of Drupal friendly. These things can be components. You can have a specific design for those things. Um, here's some other ones. Teaser, side and nav, pager, sort of things. But you can also have like watermark, bio, breaking news. What you're trying to do is you're trying to find, you're trying to look, I mean oftentimes you're gonna get like a complete page design from a designer, right? And you wanna try to look through that design and pick out little pieces that, little pieces that could be repeatable designs, right? They may not ever be repeated again, but they could be. So like main navigation, you're probably only gonna have that once on a page, right? <laughs> but it's still a component. You wanna have it, is somebody calling me? Jeez, <laughs> that's my wife, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, honey. Um, <laughs> she's in Taiwan. I don't think she knows what time it is here. Um, anyway, so you want to have um, a single, I got to take my phone out of my pocket. <laughs> you want to have a single class that describes a, spe single, a, a specific design, right? And, and these are, you're trying to make them sort of encapsulated and it just does this one thing. Um, But I wanted to talk to you about like the semantics of this, right? Watermark breaking news. These aren't sort of the traditional Drupal ways of creating classes, right? Um, it, that's because of semantics. I mean, everyone, you gotta have a semantic class, right? Well, this is my little mini rant about semantics. Semantics is the study of meaning. So in order for its semantic class, it has to have a meaning. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, num, 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 has more semantic than blah, <laughs> right? Because um, num, num, everybody knows it's Cookie Monster, that has meaning. <laughs> That's a semantic class. <laughs> so, as long as you don't name your classes, blah, 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 I'm good. <laughs> so, our content semantics, that's handled by HTML5 elements, right? If you want to describe your content, you use an HTML5 element to describe that content, you know, article, headings, H1, all that stuff. So let's make our class names that we use for design components to be design semantics, okay? So the class names become meaningful to the designers, the developers who are implementing the design on a, you know, semantic HTML5 element set of markup. Right, and the classes are all about the design. Smack, so you've probably seen a slide like this like 80 million times. Um, base, layout, module, state, theme. Actually, I, who, who here isn't familiar with Smacks? Okay, a fair number of you. So, um, base, layout, module, state, theme. It's like Jonathan Snooker looked at all the Drupal terms and said, how can I mess with them the most? <laughs> um, so module and theme, these are, just, these are not good names uh, for Drupal people. Um, so I'm gonna be using this sort of modified version. Um, and we, we had a big long debate, Morton and I, and, and a bunch of other people um, to try to come up with these sort of names and like decide within the Drupal community, this is how we're gonna talk about Max. Okay, um, so base layout components, state and skin, and basically this is a way of sort of categorizing your styles. Um, and I'm gonna skip over the explanation just for a second because I don't really like the way he's put this into these, these five things. I'd much rather have state and skin, that they are part of components, and I'm not sure why they're giving sort of equal weight in this max organization of those five things. Because state and, state and skin are really, they're part of components. So now I'll describe base layout and, and components for the rest of you. Uh, base styling is basically, it's just the styling that you apply to HTML elements. So like if you wanna add, you wanna style a paragraph, you P and give it that styling. H1, what's the styling for H1s? 
So all of your HTML element styling, that's your base HTML element styling. Layout, these are classes that you create that are specifically for moving big chunks of your page around to do layout, you know, your responsive layouts and stuff. So you have like a class that's called layout dash three column or something, and then it's, you know, that is for the wrapper, and then you'll have like another class that specifies this is the left column inside that three column layout. So all of your classes for that are related to moving your page around. Um, Pixel Whip is giving a presentation later today, I think. Uh, I don't know what the time, does anybody know what time it is, his presentation? Next. It's next, in here? It's next, somewhere. Um, <laughs> he's giving a presentation just on layout, so go talk to him about that. Um, and, and then components, these are the design components, this is what the entire rest of the presentation is about. Um, Smacks is really good to start with, and then as you start to implement it, you feel like there's some pieces missing. Uh, and for me, uh, the pieces that were missing were BEM, uh, block element modifier. So basically your components then become these, described as these five things, the actual sort of base component, elements, modifiers, states, and skin. Um, I will talk specifically what those are in the next slides. So let's start with, you know, I, I've given this presentation a few times. Uh, this is my first time giving it at a DrupalCon. Um, and I used to like show screenshots and I felt like the actual web design that was on the screen was messing with people's ability to understand these concepts because they're very new. So I decided to like make a visual analogy. Um, so the design that we're actually gonna be doing today um, is the flower component. Um, so in order to, I, I want, so I've got the flower class, and any time I use that flower class, anywhere on the page, I want it to look exactly like that, right? So if I've got an H1 element and I apply a flower class, it better look like that on my page or I've done something wrong. Um, and this can apply to any HTML element, I don't care. It's gotta have that design when I apply this class. That's what a design component is all about, right? And no other element is gonna have a flower class unless I wanted it to have this design. So instead of having these highly specific selectors, you know, nav, item, a link, we're converting the specificity from the selector into the actual naming of our design. So the, the naming of our class is the specificity, okay? So this is the component, flower. So, uh, and, and oftentimes we'll have, this is the rather complex design. So if we start to look at the individual elements of it, um, it'll have, like this requires several HTML elements, just take my word for it. Um, so we start to look at that, so like one of our divs or whatever HTML5 element is gonna get the flowers underscore underscore petals um, this other one's gonna get underscore underscore face applied to it. So those classes then are applied to individual elements within our design component because we have this complex multi-element design. Um, and I don't, I don't want you to think that, you know, these stem and, and leaves it, it, it feels like, like leaves should be nested inside stem. Well, I mean, obviously you're positioning leaves relative to the stem, yes? So it has to be nested inside it. So you can do like relative positioning or absolute positioning or something like that, right? Um, but I don't want to have the naming of the class represent the HTML hierarchy. I don't want to do that. So like I wouldn't want to do flower underscore underscore stem underscore underscore leaves to show that leaves are, have to be under inside stem. If you want to document that the leaves HTML element has to be inside the stem element, you can create a style guide for that. Um, that this is a, doing automated, automatically generated style guides is a really new thing that I just started doing. It's great, and it's perfect for this for documenting this kind of things. But don't. I've seen people do this before. Don't create flower underscore underscore stem underscore underscore leaves because you've suddenly prevented me from, from refactoring this design module so that 
there's no longer this requirement that the HTML elements must be nested, right? Because the naming insists that they must be nested. But we can no longer refactor this design component so that they're not nested, right? So just every single element is just specified using underscore, underscore, and then the name of the element. And I would like to say that, that this doesn't it doesn't even mean that leaves have to be an element within like the flower wrapper, right? That's, I'm not even, I don't even want to suggest that there's that kind of HTML hierarchy, right? Because you can also have a flower bed, underscore, underscore, bed. The flower, underscore, underscore, bed is obviously a wrapper, right? The, the flower goes inside the bed, right? Um, well, let's say we're doing like visually centering, right? <laughs> so flower bed just happens to describe a wrapper HTML element for the flower component. So elements really, they're, they're pieces of the design, but they, are, they do not represent any sort of HTML hierarchy. Um, these are a loose collection of HTML elements. Modifier. So we basically have the same design here, but was just modified slightly. So there's a lot of CSS properties that can be reused, right? So if we, instead of specifying just flower, we specify dash dash rows, it's going to use most of the CSS properties, but then there'll be like an additional rule that, that specifies how the rows is slightly different from the, the base component, right? This is a modified uh, variant component from the base component. This is our hover state. <laughs> um, <laughs> state is a really interesting one because um, states, are basically there's three kinds of states. Um, you, you have, you know, States like this, which are you know hover, active, uh, link, what, what? No, not link, but you know those kind of of selectors. Um, then we also have JavaScript interaction. So if there's some sort of JavaScript interaction where you like you click on something and then it it like adds a class to modify the design slightly, the way that you do that is like for example, um, if we want to have some sort of JavaScript interaction here. Um, this becomes the is pollinating uh, JavaScript interaction. Um, my design skills are not that good. Um, the flower is meant to look just as happy as the bee is. Um, then the, that's, so that's the second kind of state. And the third kind of state um, is our media queries, right? Those are also a kind of state of our component. Um, this is the desktop design. Um, Mid-width 48 M's, uh, so it just wraps around, just like normal flower, and we get this sort of slightly altered state um, when the media query applies. Um, and I, I would like to remind you that you know print styles; those are also media queries. So uh, print styles, uh, like for example, this is uh, yeah. There's our print style. Press flower. Um, this is just another kind of state. And then the last part here of our design component is skin. Um, this is something that Jonathan Snuka added to, to Smacks. Um, and it, it's not done very often in design anymore. Uh, it's usually um, like the skins that, that they would have at Yahoo, for example. I don't know if you remember this. They, they don't do it anymore, I don't think. The, um, if you went to like the Yahoo homepage, it was sort of like yellow colors, and then when you go to like Yahoo Finance, it would like change the, globally. Everything would be like slightly green, right? So it's a, a way to modify a large set of design components with a single modifier. And I'll, I'll I don't have a picture of that. I like what am I going to do? Like make it green and have a money symbol in the middle or something? I, this didn't have a it broke my visual analogy. So. Um, but I'll show you an example um, in the next slide here. So here's, here's what, we, what we have, all of these different parts. Um, component modifier. So you notice that I put a, uh, a single dash in here. This is why we have double dashes here, because sometimes you'll have 
a design element that you just can't figure out how to describe it semantically without using two words. Um, so you just put a single dash in between the two words, and that sort of indicates that this is the name of the component. Um, and then we'll put the double dash. That becomes uh, to show that there's a modifier, so an alternate version of that same design. Um, double underscore then, I mean, that's why we have double underscores, just to be consistent with the double dashes. Um, an n element, you know, sometimes an element will have, also have two names, or two words that require it. Um, this is our JavaScript state here, is state, and you can see that it, there's, there's no space here. This class is, is the, on, in the selector, it's, both of those classes are on the exact same element. Um, hover, and then media, what, whatever your media query is that wraps around it. And then here's the, the skin, right? So you basically, somewhere on your page, you're applying a, you know, the skin class, and it's altering all of your design components, you know, globally. So these are the different ways that you specify web components using classes. Go back here. So one more look at this. Base, layout, components, and components are broken down into components, elements, modifiers, state, and skin. Whew. Um, file organization. Um, I use a file organization that is um, broken down in basically the first three levels of snacks. So um, our base styles go into one folder, layouts go into another folder, and components going into another folder. Um, and that works really well, actually. Um, yeah, here we go. You can see example. So I, I use SAS, of course, so I have my, my styles.scss file, um, and then basically it's just sort of importing all the files from base and components and layouts. But this is my file structure. It's really simple. This is, these are the only levels of, of file structure that I need. Um, and the reason for that is because it, surprisingly, you, you end up with just a whole ton of files inside components. But it's actually really easy to find stuff. It's surprising. It seems counterintuitive to, if you have 80 files. How am I gonna find anything? But uh, I, I tried this out for the first time on a project and then we had another front-end developer come in, come in during crunch time, and he took a look at my files, and he was like, holy crap, <laughs> what did he do? And, and then, basically, he just did this. He's like, okay, he, had, he knew that he had to modify this one design, so he looked at the page, and he's like, okay, that thing, and then he inspected the DOM, saw that there was a class applied to it, and then he looked for a file with that name in the components folder, and boom, he knew exactly where to modify. He found the exact file he needed to modify. So the file names are the names of the design components. You see we've got a whole bunch of here. Hot audio button dialog, engagement badge, feature divider, feed icon. Feed. Some of these I would want to change. I'm like, ah, I don't really like the way that works, the way I named it originally. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Do not stress about what you actually name it. You're just trying to give a sort of rough approximation of what the design encapsulates. Because it's a visual design, right? Uh, maybe you won't come up with the best words originally. It's okay. You can refactor later if you want to. It's more important to just start building out your site and recognizing the actual component than it is to worry about what the actual name is. Um, and it will take a lot of practice. You'll get better at it as you do it. And you realize that it it really doesn't matter so much as long as you sort of encapsulate the design. Um, it's not so bad. Here, let's look at uh, the styles.scs folder. Or styles.scs uh, file. So I'm importing my init file, uh, underscore init.scss. That's where basically I keep all of my SAS mixins, variables, um, where I'm importing all my compass modules, whatever third-party library that I need. Um, and then, uh, usually I only have a, a normalized file inside my base styles, um, so I take like normalize and then just hack it up because 
I want to have, I want to make sure that I have some styling on all HTML elements. So I just take normalize and start adding in my styles for uh, HTML elements. And, and the way that I usually target or the way that I decide what is the design that I'm going to use on HTML elements is to think about WYSIWYG editors, right? Because WYSIWYG editors are usually horrible about trying to insert a class into whatever thing that you've just typed or you know, added to the page, right? So I just recognize that, okay, it's gonna insert some standardized markup, hopefully. Hopefully, you know, HTML5 markup. But it's gonna be really hard to insert the classes. So what do I want all of my HTML elements to look like? What design do I want them to have inside the body field? And that becomes what I specify in my base styling. And then inside all my design components, they're overriding that default. But the WYSIWYG, the body field, that's getting the default design from base. And layout rules, like every single individual layout, like, it gets its own file, right? Um, so, and I'll have like, it's not even per page, it's like I'll have a L dash header, for example, that's you know the, the layout for the header and how it sort of modifies itself as it goes across larger and larger screen sizes. And, and all of that is encapsulated inside that file. Um, I'll have a footer one, you know, like on story pages, on pages that are, you know, like node story, right? I'll have like a story layout that works with those, you know, the layouts, the panels layout that I use or whatever, right? And then finally where I'm just sort of importing all of my components, just right there. It's really pretty simple. Um, I realized that I talked really fast, which is good. Um, because one of the things that I, I didn't get to show you, and I haven't really shown anybody, is uh, the automated style guide. So let me jump out of my slides real fast. Um, there should be plenty of time for, for questions. But one of the really useful things um, that I did recently on a project, um, msnbc.com, um, I implemented a style guide, an auto-generating style guide. And see if I can pull it up here. It's really hard to see all the, the buttons from this angle. Okay, window, reopen, close tab, there we go. Okay. Here we go. Um, so there's a thing called KSS, um, Neath Style, I think it's Neath Style Sheets, um, and it's a way that you can specify, um, you can basically write some, some comments inside your SAS files. Um, and then you just run this tool and you say, okay, that's where my SAS files are. This is where my generated CSS is. Now, run right now and generate me a style guide, a bunch of static HTML files based off of that input. Um, and this is the, the one uh, that I did. This is the only one that I've actually done because I just finished this project a couple months ago. Um, and in it, it just gives me an example of like what do the heading levels want look like, um, and you can see it shows you the sort of example HTML that I'm using, and then the actual style right here. Right? I mean, this is a real style because it's it's pulling in the generated CSS. So this is the same CSS file that we're using for our theme on the Drupal site. So these aren't Drupal pages, but it's the same CSS. Um, and the way that you specify that is, is, is actually really easy too. Um, let me find that. Here we go. Okay. 
So this site was broken up a little differently inside my base. There was actually several files there. Um, so for heading one, I basically have this little code comment at the very beginning here. Can you guys see that? Or do I need to make it bigger? Okay. So I specify, I'll scroll this way, so it's a little higher. I specify the, that, you know, describe it. So like this is heading one, I give in a sort of example markup, um, and then just specify what section of the style guide I want this to appear in. Um, and because the comments are right next to the actual implementation, I would have to be really, really dumb not to update the docs when I update this style. Like if I have to modify this in some way that's relevant to the documentation, modify or just do it all at once and then just rerun the, the style guide generator tag or the, the script. Right. Um, th there's actually, I should specify, there's, there's a, uh, a Ruby version of KSS, which I could never get to work because it assumes way too much Ruby knowledge. Uh, but there's also a Node.js implementation of it, KSS Node, uh, and that one actually worked when I tried it, which was, you know, po very positive. Right, so Node KSS is what I actually used um, to generate these. Um, and I go back over here, and I can show you. So base, um, headings, you know, here's what links look like. Here's like an example s section of text. Um, yeah, and then let's go over to our components. So, yeah, so this one, this style guide I actually generated after the fact, um, and I came onto the project very late too. So it, it sort of exposed some interesting bugs in our implementation. For example, this co design component is applied with an ID selector, which I really hate, but I didn't know that until I generated the style guide, right? So I would like this to be a you know, class logo instead of an ID. But this is the HTML that's required in order to get that, that design. Right? Um, that's not very interesting. There's a, a bunch of different styles, uh, classes that are used for ads. Um, here's vertical styling on an ad. Uh, the, the, the dotted lines I actually um, added to the example markup just so you could see where the different pieces are. Um, so you can, you can modify the example to add in some inline styles to, to make it easier to visualize actually what's going on. Let's, let's find, here's a better one. So here's our, our uh, author names. Uh, this is the bylines on different stories. Um, and when I want, um, when I want just this sort of default styling on author names, I just use the uh, author dash names design components class. Um, and then there's a modified one with a border underneath it, author names dash dash border. You know, don't stress too much about exactly, you know, what you name these things. It's, it's more important that you encapsulate the, the design than it is to, to name it. Um, and here's another variation of it. Um, this, this is, requires slightly different uh, HTML syntax um, because it has like this sort of partner logo next to it. Right. Breadcrumbs. The, the, the great thing about implementing this, the, this automated generated style guide as you build the site is it really helps you to focus on what am I actually building? Have I really encapsulated this component well? Um, it, it makes it much easier to, to create components if you've got an automated style guide that just runs as you're building stuff. Um, but it's also really useful like this after the fact to sort of like, oh, let's see what's going on here. Because one of the things that I discovered when I did this was that we had a SAS uh, variable called, what was it? It was like, I think the, the name was like purple or something like that. And the actual color was green. <laughs> and I didn't know that until I did the automated style guide. Um, anyway, I, if anybody has specific questions about how to do this, um, I'm around the next few days. Um, and uh, again, that was 
uh, node KSS to do this. Um, and let's go back to slides now. Actually, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you have questions, there's a microphone somewhere. Is it right in the middle? Can people walk over there? I can't really see from this angle. Yeah, okay. You can. Good. Hi, John. Um, so you Hello, Martin. I'm glad you did not put any dirty pictures in your session, so I don't have to count on my next session. But that's actually not the question. You're showing the style guide. Is that a thing um, we should get into Drupal 8? Uh, oh, yeah. So the, the classes... Um, the, the, the naming of this stuff that I mentioned in SMAX, that we, we do have some documentation um, that really describes in detail exactly how this stuff works. Um, and it was, it was a group effort. A whole bunch of people worked on it um, within the mobile initiative for Drupal 8. Um, and uh, I don't remember the URL, but it's in the documentation. Um, you can find it somewhere. I can tweet about it later, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. I guess. I forgot my picture of you in one of these slides. Exactly. Ah. Um, in a session in two hours, there's going to be a very good picture of John Alban paying his way through Drupal. Oh, are you doing this? <laughs> You're going to make me pull it up now. Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. This is from the, the fugly selector hack. <laughs> this is just for you, Morton. Right. So this is one thing that I forgot to mention is that when you're, when you're using Drupal, sometimes it's really hard to put classes exactly where you want them. You may have noticed this problem, right? Uh, so I came up with the, the fugly selector hack. Obligatory Morton reference. <laughs> um, and basically the, the hack is a way to, um, so yeah, right. So sometimes there's a, a specific CSS selector that's really ugly that I have to use because Drupal, right? And I can't change the classes that I want to use. So like I have to do feature underscore title and then A because I can't figure out how to insert a class into the link because it's like some render array inside this thing. And ah! Right, so instead um, I will just, I'll use the fugly selector but then I will extend the beautiful, sort of lovely design component class that I wish I could use, right? Um, and for some reason, this works really well. Uh, <laughs> because you've been thinking about all these design components as being independent, it doesn't matter that I accidentally increased the specificity of this particular selector, because it's still very independent, right? No one else is, is going to use that same selector. You're not going to have any design component collisions going on. This is a great, great technique when you can't get into Drupal's internals to change it, the class that you really need. So just for you, Moin. <laughs> Thank you. I was uh, curious if you had any opinions on... Um, Grouping classes within your uh, CSS or within your um, your markup, your HTML or template or whatever. Um, I was reading uh, Harry Roberts is like grouping them with brackets around, so you have like a series of BEM classes, and you actually put like class equals and then brackets around related sets of classes. Um, just curious if you if you think about how you group them together for like readability and findability. Um, or any thoughts on that? Um, well, Does that make kind of, sense? I, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't thought about that before at all. Um, so you really caught me off guard. Um, but the, the, the ideas behind design components are sort of independent of the actual selector you use, as we discovered with the fugly selector, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, as long as you can work out a way, if you don't use the BEM syntax, which is that double dash, double underscore, mm -hmm. and use some other syntax, find a naming convention that works for you and stick with it. Right. Um, I highly recommend the, the BEM syntax, double dash, double underscore, because it's easy, straightforward. It looks ugly at first, but it's really useful. 
How do you draw the line between what's a layout and what's a component? Right. Um, so, so layouts really are about like big chunks of the page, right? Now, with any component, you may have like be moving stuff around a little bit, um, and it's fine to have a little bit of layout within your component, like relative positioning or maybe even absolute positioning. Um, but basically, it, it's all relative to the other sort of loose collection of other HTML elements that are inside your design component, right? So a little bit of layout inside there is fine, but it's not about page layout where you're moving big chunks of the page. And, and basically, um, if there's layout inside that design component, a little bit of layout within that design component, you should be needing that same layout every time you use that design component. Unless like you have like, like you can have variations where you like tweak one of the positioning of one element, right? That, I have that sometimes. Well, I'll make a modifier that, that tweaks the layout a little bit. But you, you wouldn't have, say, the page as a component and that just has the page layout in it or the header as a component. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could think about it, the page as a component and then all the layouts are just part of that, but mm -hmm. yeah. And, and uh, why not use uh, directories within, subdirectories within components in order to sort of chunk up the long list of files? Is there a reason for that? Um, so I, so if you start doing subdirectories inside your components to like group them logically together, you, you, you lose the findability a little bit because you're like, somebody's new comes into the project and they're like, okay, I just inspected the DOM, I find that name, so I'm looking for that file, and now I have to look in like seven or eight different subfolders in order to find that file name. But I mean, if, if you have some like development tools, obviously like, a bunch of them you can just sort of type the name and it'll find the file wherever it is in the system for you. I'm not opposed to it, but it just, I don't really find it necessary. So let's say we're in the middle of a, a website development project right now and we want to move more towards the model that you've described. Any suggestions on taking what we have and translating it into what you've told us about? Yeah, so um, I, I've been on projects before where, um, you know, like it's already been done once and we're just like tweaking it. Um, you, you, can, you can transition your site if you're like halfway through to the design. You don't have to throw everything away and start over. Um, it actually works out relatively well as like all the new stuff, you try to use this model um, because they're highly independent. They're also independent of all the like awful ways that you did it the first half of the project. So it usually works out okay, or relatively okay. Anyway. So it's okay to do like half the site poorly and wait until you have time to kind of transition that into. Right, you can come back and refactor later and it, it, it'll be, you know, you, yeah. I mean, that, that's just the reality because if you can have like unlimited time, well, yeah, we'll just start over. No, that's not gonna happen, right? But it's okay, it's okay to do the, like switch the methodologies because the, these are, they're highly independent so they're, they're not going to have that, that big of an effect on the other earlier stuff. It's more likely that the earlier stuff is going to have effect on, your later, on the later stuff. Um, so you may find that there are specific rules that you have to refactor because they were, they have too generic a class at the very end of the selector and they're bleeding across into you know, your design components that you build later. So um, one thing that I should also say is that um, a particular HTML element could actually have a layout class on it and a design component, that's okay. Um, there's, there's no reason why you can't have uh, nested components as well. So like you have a design on the thing and then like inside the HTML there's another component that just happens to be smaller and fits within your other larger design component. That's okay, we're, we're not specifying that they have to be next to each other, right? We just sort of want them to be independent of each other. No more questions? Okay. Thank you, everybody.